Oh! Oh! What is that? Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings delivered one of the MCU's best standalone features yet, thanks to kinetic fight choreography, a charming new leading man, plenty of heart and humor, and of course, a compelling and complex villain played by Hong Kong legend Tony Leung. But I know your eyes were probably distracted by the awesome martial arts, the amazing dragon fight, and of course, Trevor Slattery, but there were a ton of hidden details packed into Marvel's latest movie. Did you catch all these Easter eggs and hidden references? Let's find out right now. One of the big trailer moments leading up to the release of the Shang-Chi movie was the final shot of the film's second trailer, which saw Abomination make his grand return while fighting none other than Wong in a cage match. This was a big deal as Tim Roth's Emil Blonsky hasn't been around since the Phase 1 movie The Incredible Hulk, and that movie tends to be ignored by the MCU since it features an Ed Norton looking Bruce Banner. But I don't think anyone predicted the way this scene ultimately played out in Shang-Chi. While the two characters fought, both got to display their impressive skill sets, with Abomination using his brute force and Wong using his portals to make Abomination knock himself out. And you would think that would be it, but there's actually more. After the fight, Wong and Abomination are talking, and it's revealed that the two are working together, right before Wong opens up a portal for them to leave. It's hard to make out, but the other end of the portal doesn't look like the Sanctum Sanctorum. It actually looks like the Raft Prison, which is the super secret and super secure prison in the middle of the ocean that housed the Rebel Avengers in Civil War. Is Abomination now being housed in the raft while Wong works to rehabilitate him? If so, why? Is Wong helping train Abomination? It seems that way based on their dialogue. Or is this some sort of off-the-books operation that just wanted to see Wong make a little extra money on the side? So many questions. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings featured a surprising cameo from a Spider-Man homecoming character. And I heard a rumor. You know who he is? No, unfortunately, it wasn't anyone major, but it was still a lot of fun. The vlogger on the bus in Shang-Chi's standout action sequence is the same guy who yelled at Spider-Man in Homecoming and asked him to do a flip. His name is Clev, and you have to wonder if these two appearances are going to set up more appearances down the line. Will he be someone who cameos in multiple movies? I wouldn't mind seeing him pop up again and reveal more about his mysterious past. I mean, in Shang-Chi, we learned he did a little martial arts as a kid. How fascinating. Maybe we can expect him to show up in the Eternals and talk about how he's a history buff so would know the details about the Eternals presence on Earth or have him in Blade or something to freak out over vampires. Either or. Sure, why not? The mid credit scene in Shang-Chi was one of the most memorable stingers in a long time. It not only set up the sequel perfectly with a compelling mystery, but it also welcomed Shang-Chi and Katie to the Avengers. Which, quick side note, I get inviting Shang-Chi, but Katie, she just learned how to use a bow and arrow a few days earlier. What, are you looking to replace Hawkeye or something? Anyways, before the awesome ending where Shang-Chi, Katie, and Wong go karaoke singing, we get quick glimpses of Captain Marvel and Bruce Banner. That's right, I said Bruce Banner. But where's Professor Hulk? Endgame established that Bruce and Hulk worked out their differences by Bruce spending 18 months in a gamma lab to fuse their brain and the brawn together permanently. Best of both worlds. So why is Bruce in human form in the mid credit scene? Does it have something to do with the snap he did? His arm is still in a sling after all, suggesting that the damage there is permanent. This is something that absolutely needs to be addressed, and with Mark Ruffalo set to return in the She-Hulk TV show, look for answers there. When Shang-Chi and Katie travel to meet Shang-Chi's sister, they're met with a bit of a surprise. After checking out a seemingly run-down building, it's revealed to be the site of an epic and secretive fight club that's popular on the dark web all around the world. As the two heroes make their way through the crowd of interesting-looking fighters, one thing stands out. In one of the smaller cages, there's a fight going on that sees an extremist soldier in the middle of a brawl. It's never mentioned, but the glowing red body is a complete giveaway. The extremist soldiers were, of course, the main villains in Iron Man 3, and although it looked like all of them were dispatched by the end of the movie, it's clear now there are more running around. And yes, I know we saw the extremist soldiers play a part in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but it's hard to tell how canon that show is anymore. Trevor Slattery is back. We all sort of expected it one way or another, but you gotta admit that Trevor's role in the new movie unfolded in a way you didn't expect. Like, could anyone have guessed that Trevor was going to be the one who had the key to guiding our heroes to the secret city thanks to his connection with a mythical faceless creature named Morris? I don't think so. And in the film, we do get a retelling of Iron Man 3 and how the villains took the Mandarin name because Wen Wu was retired. But on top of that, Trevor tells the story about how a producer interviewed him in jail, 
but then broke him out to take him to the real Mandarin. No, sorry. I still don't get it. Just in case you didn't see it, this was actually a reference to the Marvel one-shot known as All Hail the King, which was included on the Thor The Dark World DVD, but of course can now be viewed on YouTube. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out. I mean, it even includes a Justin Hammer cameo. When's he coming back? The MCU has changed forever thanks to the blip. What, we're still calling it that? As Ant-Man would say, is it too late to change the name? Anyways, thanks to Thanos' actions, half of Earth disappeared for five years before surprisingly coming back. Every post-Endgame movie will have to address this in some capacity going forward. And although it was a major plot point in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, it was treated as more of a joke in Spider-Man Far From Home, as they just said, oh, all of Peter's class was snapped away and came back to get over any weird narrative hurdle. And they kind of did it with Shang-Chi too. Were any of the main characters affected by the snap? If Wen Wu wasn't snapped away, how did his crime organization function for those five years? Those types of questions hurt my brain. All we really got in reference to the events of Endgame were posters plastered around San Francisco talking about support groups for blip anxiety. I guess that's better than nothing. This one is more of a meta reference. In a funny scene, Shang-Chi has to explain the fact that he's not Korean, which feels mostly like a shout-out to Simu Liu's breakout role in the hit comedy Kim's Convenience. In that show, Liu plays the son of a Korean couple who run a convenience store in Toronto. The show is Canadian, and it became a huge crossover success in the United States, much like the award-winning comedy Schitt's Creek. If you haven't watched it, go check it out. In real life, Liu was born in China and immigrated to Canada when he was five years old. The secret fight club that Zhai Ling runs is called the Golden Daggers Club, which is a pretty cool name for anything if I'm being honest. Put golden in front of any sort of weapon and make that your name for a restaurant, bar, sporting arena, mini mall, anything like that and you'll have yourself a popular place. But the Golden Daggers name actually is a fun comic reference. In the Shang-Chi comics, Golden Daggers is a name of a gang that one of Shang-Chi's sisters, known as Bao Yu, formed when she escaped her father's control. You see, in the comics, Shang-Chi doesn't have one sister, he has a bunch of them. And although that wasn't the same in the movie, the writers seem to take elements from each sister and combine them together to make the entirely new character of Zhai Ling. Jackie Chan is one of the most famous martial artists in the world. Obviously a legend in his own country, Chan also is a huge international star and people around the world grew up watching his movies that combined jaw-dropping martial arts with a perfect blend of comedy. I mean, I'll say Rush Hour 2 is a personal favorite movie of mine, which I've seen at least 30 times. He's amazing to watch, so it's no surprise that Shang-Chi, a movie all about martial arts, would want to pay homage to one of the greats. It's been said that in the bus fight, which again, I'll say is an absolute triumph of a fight scene, there's an instance where Shang-Chi uses his jacket as a weapon. A lot of people have said this looks very similar to the move Jackie Chan uses in Rumble in the Bronx, and it turns out this was intentional. Simu Liu has talked about how much they wanted to include a reference to Chan. Mission accomplished. Now the next movie should include a scene where Shang-Chi jumps through a tiny grate in a casino, just like Rush Hour 2. I mean, they already had a bamboo fight, so why not? Shang-Chi traditionally wears a lot of red in his costume, and going into the film, it was a wonder to see if his superhero duds would lean more traditionally or have a bit of a modern update. For a while there, it looked like Shang-Chi would just be wearing plain clothes throughout the movie. His first outfit had a red and white color scheme, and the way he moved around in it convinced me that Shang-Chi doesn't necessarily need a special costume to look cool and perform his awesome kung fu. Maybe he was just going to be dressed like this the entire movie. But of course, he got his special dragon scale armor for the finale, and although a little basic, it still looks functional and gets the job done. Though a part of me does kind of wish he fought that entire finale in jeans and sneakers. Hmm, I don't think the Great Protector would have liked that. The Marvel logo continues to expand and grow with every passing movie, and it's been fun to check out all the tiny tweaks they add to it. I mean, I don't think the Marvel logo has nearly enough Hawkeye, but that's a conversation for a different day. Anyways, the Marvel logo for Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings now includes the all-women scene from Avengers Endgame, where Captain Marvel and the MCU's fiercest female fighters all gather together to take on Thanos' forces. A worthy addition, I might add. This isn't that important to the Shang-Chi film, but I think it's worth a mention. Okay, now who do I talk to about them adding the scene where Professor Hulk gives Ant-Man a taco? That needs to be there. So I get that the Iron Gang in Shang-Chi wanted revenge, but did they really go about it the best way? They were mad at Wen Wu for all he did with the Ten Rings, so they came to his home to take his wife out of the picture permanently, and although it was successful, all it did was make Wen Wu angry enough to get back into a life of crime and wipe out the members of the Iron Gang. 
Anyways, the Iron Gang is another comic reference, with it being one of the gangs that Fu Manchu, which was Shang-Chi's father in the comics, ran in the comics. I wonder how much things would be different if instead of a rival gang like in the movie, the gang that comes to eliminate Shang-Chi's mom once worked for Wenwu. Do you think he would have been so guilty that he wouldn't have put back on the rings? In the film, the big question, thanks to the mid credit scene, is where exactly did the rings come from? It's a plot point that's sure to be the main conflict of the inevitable sequel. The movie kept where Wenwu got the rings as a mystery at the beginning, and now we know why. Gotta set up that second movie. The explanation they did give us, though, is a fun callback to the comics. The movie says that some legends see Wenwu finding them in a cave, suggesting they've been on Earth forever. Others suggest he found them in a crater, which suggests alien origin. In the comics, the rings were actually made from materials from a downed spaceship that the Mandarin found and belonged to an ancient race of space dragons known as the McLuhans. Fingers crossed for Fin Fang Foom in the sequel. As you sat through the credits to see the end credits scenes, you might have noticed the film was dedicated to Brad Allen. If you were curious on who that was, Brad was actually the stunt coordinator for the film who tragically passed away in August of this year. It's a tragic loss. Allen was part of Jackie Chan's stunt coordinator team and really gave the film a special look with its amazing fight choreography. R.I.P. Brad, whoever is responsible for the fight choreography for the next film has very large shoes to fill. Katie was one of the best sidekick characters in a Marvel movie that we've seen. Not only was she a perfect comic relief, but she had her own arc in terms of becoming her own hero. One funny detail about her is that when she's in a fight situation, she'll start singing Hotel California as it will immediately disarm whoever's attacking her. And it worked too, but the song actually ties in with the movie pretty well. It's about entering a dangerous world and trying desperately to find a way out, but with no success. This parallels Shang-Chi's own journey as he tried to escape the dark and seedy world his father was grooming him for. The posters on Shang-Chi's wall in his garage apartment revealed some interesting things about our titular character, mainly that he has excellent movie taste. We see posters of Kung Fu Hustle, The Warriors, and The Godfather, and you have to wonder what Shang-Chi likes about these movies. Do you think he watches Kung Fu Hustle and thinks he can do better than them? And already, The Godfather is one of the greatest movies of all time, but do you think Shang-Chi watches that film, which at its core is about a towering father figure running a criminal empire, while his innocent son slowly gets dragged into the family business and gets a little uncomfortable? He's probably the only one who's sad that Michael Corleone becomes the new Godfather at the end of the movie for obvious reasons. Early on in the film, Katie's grandma mentions how the Day of the Dead is coming up and makes a joke about how a bottle of whiskey disappeared from her husband's grave. If you were like me, you thought the Day of the Dead would be a big factor in the plot, but nothing major came from it on a story level, but thematically it connected to the entire movie. Katie's grandma's explanation of honoring those who had passed had an interesting parallel to Wenwu's journey, who found himself going down a dark path in order to rescue his deceased wife, who he believed was trapped in a dark realm in Talo. Shang-Chi even throws it in Wenwu's face about how he isn't honoring his mom's memory by threatening to destroy everything. I think that's a fun thematic callback overall, don't you? When Shang-Chi is standing shirtless in the Golden Daggers Fight Club, I understand it might be hard to look at anything else. But if you look closely, you'll see the Madripoor flag hanging in the background. Madripoor is an island in Marvel Comics that a lot of villains like to hang out in thanks to its strict non-extradition laws. And we've already seen this place in Phase 4 of the MCU as it was featured in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier TV show where it gave us the iconic moment of Baron Zemo dancing. Can we go back there please? It wouldn't be a Disney movie if there weren't some fun, adorable side creature that they could make toys out of. In this case, that means Morris, the Dai Zhang that Trevor thought only he could see. But if you were curious about this creature, as well as all the other fantastical creatures in Shang-Chi, then you're in luck. These actually weren't just comic-based creatures, but they all exist in ancient Chinese mythology. Like, go and Google Foo Dogs, and I think you'll immediately want one as a pet. Oh, is that just me? You're right, the food bill for one of those things would be enormous. Talo opened up a whole new world for the MCU, and I think I mean that literally. Michelle Yeoh's Nan is one of the protectors of Talo, and when she speaks to Shang-Chi about stopping Wenwu, she says things like protecting your universe. That implies that Talo isn't in our universe and exists separately in a different universe. In the comics, Talo is a pocket dimension and exists outside our main universe. We've already seen other instances of this in the MCU with things like Doctor Strange's Dark Dimension and even the Quantum Realm. But the question is, how does Talo exist within the big multiverse that the MCU is building up? 
You know, I could name it one more super secret thing, but instead I just want to rave about shang chi and Katie singing karaoke with Wong. That was one of the best mid credit scenes the MCU has ever done, and you can't convince me otherwise. More karaoke scenes, please. Uh, I just, I gotta say, I'm proud of you all. Yay us.